Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining me. In this session, I want to talk to you about uh, comparing religion and relationship. Uh, again, looking at the book of Galatians, uh, uh, there just seems to be so much with this idea of salvation. And and I don't know if if this topic is because God wants me to pass this on to you or if it's just for me. Sometimes as a Bible teacher, you get caught between that. Um, is what God's teaching me what I need to, to teach and share with others? And, and uh, so I'm just going to assume that that's the case. Because this whole di- idea of salvation, I believe it is an issue for us right now because there are so many people I believe that think they're saved but aren't and they could be in a process of coming into more of a deeper revelation of who Jesus is, what he's actually done, and what it means to receive salvation. I think I've talked to you two or three times ago, uh, had a conversation with a woman who thought she was saved for a lot of years, was a part of a really good church. Then uh, she got caught up in some things and wondered, how in the world did I get here? And she began to seek God coming out of that. And she says that at that point, she had a born-again experience. She'd never had that before. She thought she was a believer because she was attending church and going to Bible studies and that kind of thing and had a heart for God. But when she had what she calls her born-again experience, revelation opened up, a worship life. She had spiritual gifting that began to show itself, and um, everything changed. So uh, I think that can be the result of telling somebody that they're a Christian uh, prematurely. We've got to let people work this out on their own, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And according to John 3, the, the Spirit of God needs to bear witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. <clears throat> if we short-circuit that process, uh, we do damage to that individual. Okay, so I want to look at, uh, begin to just compare. I, I'm doing uh, some study on another project, and I'm looking at Jesus's tension with the Pharisees. It's just constant. And um, of all the people that you think he'd run into problems with, it wouldn't be those that are running the synagogue. But there's a there's a lesson here for us to learn. So at the beginning of the churches uh, in Galatia, there, there were Judaizers who showed up immediately. The Judaizers are those Jews, and I mean religious Jews, who believed in Jesus, but they also believed that in order to get salvation, you had to maintain the works of the law. <clears throat> so these works of the law, so, uh, maintaining strict Sabbath requirements and uh, circumcision, but they were they were the enemy of the freedom in Jesus. So I want to take you back and just review how the church at Galatia began and kind of give you a snapshot of what Paul was going through and why he's focused so strongly on uh, getting this this message across to the Galatians um, in in chapter 3. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He sees... They have abandoned ship when it comes to the things of the Spirit. And remember, they don't have a New Testament. We have it. They didn't. A New Testament was not going to come together for 300 years. So the Judaizers were believing in Jesus, but also they had to maintain the the works of the law. So in Acts 13 and 14, Paul is working his way through on a missionary journey through those churches that are those cities that are in the area of Galatia. And specifically, it's going to be the city of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. They, they fall in that, which would be today modern-day Turkey. So looking at uh, Acts 13, verses 44 to 47, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God because God was moving there. <clears throat> but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. The Jews saw the multitudes, they see what God's doing, and they're envious because you're taking our people. That is a very religious viewpoint. Don't take stuff from my, from my thing. And contradicting and blaspheming, they oppose the things spoken by Paul. 
Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, Jews, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. And I want you to see, first of all, <clears throat> when you give your life to serve God, especially those of you who are called to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim truth, to, to teach and to preach, do not be shocked when you are opposed. This every time, every time Jesus stood up and proclaimed the truth, the religious opposition came at him. You just need to know that's going to happen. When it doesn't happen, thank you, Lord. But you don't want to get caught unaware. Opposition, they're, they aren't just opposing you. You don't want to take it personal. They're opposing the message. They are being driven by the kingdom of darkness. There is a spiritual influence that's on them that is pushing them into your path to, to confront the message that you're speaking. Now, the result was then Paul and Barnabas grew bold. They didn't back off. So immediately they declare the truth and they get opposition that comes at them. Now we move on to Acts 14, verse 1. Paul has moved on to the next city in Iconium. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided. This is, a, this is what preaching the truth does. It creates division. Part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, Paul and his team, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. And they were preaching the gospel there. So again, they go to another city and God is moving in these places. There are new converts. But the religious people stand up and oppose them. Those that would fall into the category of being religious are always against the supernatural power of God. Religion is rigid. It's inflexible. It goes by a statement of faith. There's certain things that we don't bend on here. Yes, the truth of God's word, we don't want to bend on it. We want to stay there. But I need to be flexible when I believe something in the word and God does something in front of me. Then I come back and I, I seek God. Was that you? I've got to figure this out. So I hold strongly to the fact that this is God's word, but my understanding of it, I hold loosely. I'm always willing to, to be stretched to the max in order to learn something new. I don't want to reject things just because they're new. I want to know, Lord, is that you? Are you the one that's doing this? And usually a religious person just becomes very inflexible and can't it's very difficult to learn new things, especially when it comes to the things of the Spirit. And that's what Paul was running into in Galatians. He kept saying to him, are you, who bewitched you? Who did this? Who tricked you? Who deceived you? You started out in the Spirit, and now you're falling back on your flesh, what you can work out on your own, because it was more comfortable. It didn't stretch him as far. All right, so then Paul moves on to another city. Uh, he went to Lystra. The Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. So now they're following him. They're moving from city to city with him. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. So I wonder, I wonder what happened there. Was a miracle performed? Was it a healing? I mean, this crowd... You know that this crowd, that's not their first stoning. And they thought he was dead. Maybe he was. And they drug him outside the city, and the other disciples gathered around him, and something happened. He comes back to life. And the next day, he departed with Barnabas to Derby. So, okay, so this isn't a very good city. Let's go to the next one and see what happens there. 
He's not quitting. He's not giving up. He's not going to take some time off. Verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, where all the resistance had been. He went back there. Why did he do that? Because he has disciples. He's got new converts. He doesn't care about the opposition anymore. He's, he's accepting it. He's already laid his life down as a, as a sacrifice. He's got to feed the people. When Jesus reinstated Peter, what did he say? If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. So if you've been called to feed, you got to go back and do it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter at what cost. You have to do this. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. That's not a, that's not a weak message. You know, it's kind of like come and die. There's going to be a lot of tribulation here. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, who knows how long they had been there? I mean, it wasn't, it, they hadn't been there very long. It was a very short time. So he's got all these new converts. He's already appointing leaders. I mean, you, you do what you got to do. This early church, you know, you hear so many people, let's get back to the first century. Let's get back to the book of Acts. It was messy. It was, it was very, very messy. And just remember, this isn't like you'd pull out your New Testament. They got letters from the apostles in the Old Testament Scripture, and the Old Testament Scripture, in order to see Jesus in it, you've got to have the Spirit of God giving you revelation and insight to pull that out of there. So you can't be a fake believer. You're, you're going to have to have the real deal. You've got to have discernment that's within you. <clears throat> so... You can see walking through this, the ones that are, that are standing firmly against the move of the Spirit are the religious leaders. This is the tension that's always there. Jesus, uh, I was reading in the book of John, Jesus heals the lame man at Bethesda, and he tells the guy, rise up and walk, and take up your bed and walk. So he takes up his bed and he walks, and he goes to the synagogue, and the Pharisees at the synagogue go, hey, it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to be working. You shouldn't be carrying your bed. They, they missed out on the miracle. They're looking at, they're nitpicking over things, over things that are important to them. You know, over and over, um, Jesus constantly doing miracles, and it was almost like he, he chose the Sabbath to do the miracles so that he would irritate the fire out of the, the Pharisees. I kept thinking, you know, they're, they're just so into maintaining circumcision and the Sabbath that they're missing out on the supernatural. Why is this? I went back and I was reading about uh, what Jeremiah had to say about going into captivity when the children of Israel were taken into captivity and uh, taken into Babylon for 70 years. <clears throat> and at, at the end of the book of Second Chronicles, it says they were taken in there because they didn't let the land lie and rest with no crops being planted on the seventh year. The seventh year was a year of rest. It was a Sabbath year. And according to the Old Testament law in Leviticus, they were to, they were to not plant any crops on that seventh year. They were to trust the Lord. So the, the principle in the kingdom of God is the seventh is rest. Seventh day of the week is rest. And you know, the way I was raised, you go to church on Sunday. So to me, the the Sabbath, the discussion of the Sabbath, even when it comes to Seventh day Adventists that say you're you're to go to church on Sunday or to go to church on Saturday. If you look at the description of the Sabbath, it, it, there's nowhere in there that says that's supposed to be the day that you worship. <clears throat> but most of us put those two together. But on the seventh day, you're to rest. On the seventh year, you're to rest. And on the seventh, seventh year, the 50th year is to be a year of jubilee that everything goes back to its original owner and you just celebrate uh, 
the goodness of God and the provision of God. Well, <clears throat> there, that isn't happening. So because the land wasn't left to rest every seventh year, part of the judgment of going into the 70 years was every one of those seventh years that was skipped, God collected on it. So for 490 years, they're not doing it, and the land got its rest from those 70 years. <clears throat> so picture yourself being a Pharisee. We went into captivity because we didn't celebrate the Sabbaths. So the Sabbath becomes a big deal. The problem is they weren't fearing the Lord. They were afraid of the Lord. They were afraid of judgment. They were straining at words in the law, but they weren't seeking the face of God. They weren't looking for a relationship with God. They were trying to stay out of trouble. Their heart wasn't engaged. They were afraid of what might happen. <clears throat> that is the heart of the religious person. What do I need to do to get the pressure off of me? It isn't the pursuit of the relationship. That's what we're after. <clears throat> All right, Paul rebukes the church in Galatia for getting off track. In Galatians 3, Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? By the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So they've made this shift and they're not trusting. It's being led by the Spirit is everything in the kingdom of God. Everything. <clears throat> the Spirit is to lead me into the truth. The Spirit is to teach me from the Word of God. The Spirit does that. I don't do that in my own energy. If I come to the Bible in my own energy, it's just a, an old book. But if I allow the Spirit to pull the life out of it that's here, it means something to me. If I begin in the Spirit, I have to continue on with Him because He's going to give me revelation. He's going to transfer something from the heart of the Father to me. The Spirit promotes relationship, and the flesh promotes religion. He's saying, you started in the Spirit. That's going to lead you into relationship. But you're finishing up with religion, and that's going to result in in rigidity and division and judgmental attitudes toward those that don't follow the rules. The Galatians were under pressure to revert back to the flesh and religion. Now remember, these are young believers. So these are young believers that started in the spirit, but then here comes the religious voices. This is, this is the weight that Paul had to carry. He's constantly carrying this weight of the churches and their growth. He's, he's having to give himself to all of these new believers who don't understand things. He's had these powerful encounters with God. He's received the revelation, and now he's got to keep them on track. This is the, this is the life of a preacher and a teacher, constantly coming back, reminding, how are you doing? What's going on here? It seems like you're going this way. It seems to me that this is happening. It's a constant weight when you're in close proximity, discipling and carrying somebody into maturity. It's, it's an all-consuming job. Remember, Paul mentioned uh, with the Ephesians, he spent time night and day with tears, night and day, spending time with them, getting them the teaching to keep them on track. Why is it important? Because if he doesn't uh, walk them through how to walk with God and walk in the Spirit— the religious zealots will come behind him and poison their minds and derail the gospel. It takes time to create a mature leader. You know, uh, I wrote down here, remember the phrase from the book of Deuteronomy, in, and this is in King James, take heed to thyself. Take heed to thyself. you got to pay attention. You have, to, you have to know that as a child of God, when you start to study the Word, there's a spiritual influence that's coming after you. And there, it's, it's going to put pressure on you. And in those early years, it's very difficult. You need to have somebody 
as a mentor, a spiritual parent, some kind of a leader that can take you and you can ask questions to and you can talk through certain issues. This is very difficult to bring a believer to maturity. It takes years. It takes years. Uh, I one time heard Graham Cook say, uh, those that have been called to the fivefold ministries, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, it's going to take you with a mentor, it'll take you 15 years to understand that position and that call. Without a mentor, 30. And I would say maybe even longer to really come into the fullness of understanding all the nuts and bolts of of a leadership position in the kingdom of God. It's just hard work to come to to maturity. And most of you, if you've been uh, following Jesus for, I'll say, at least 30 years, you've had some rough times. You've gone through some periods of time where you just said, I'm, I'm punching out. I'm done with this. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. I can't fulfill it. You know, the lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, the pride of life, all that stuff just comes in on you. There's just so much to learn. Sometimes it becomes overwhelming and you just got to take a break learning. All of us go through that up and down process. It takes time. We've got to, we've got to bring each other back into remembrance of some of those early lessons that we learned. All right, let me talk real quick about uh, religion and dead works. Um, religion can produce a false sense of right standing with God. Paul would not let that happen to the believers in Galatia. Now listen to uh, Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. And this is Jesus. He's going to teach a parable. Um, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised or looked down upon others. Let me say that again. Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised or looked down upon others. That is a definition of religion, a religious spirit where, hey, you know, I'm doing I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm trusting in myself. I'm doing all right. But look at these other people. Just no, just no humility. Then he goes into the parable. Two men went up in the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector, Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. (laughs) And the tax collector, standing far off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's a guy that's on his path to real, true, born-again experience with God. It's understanding. I I bring nothing to this. I bring nothing to this. I I have no confidence in, in my life. I am broken and empty, and Lord, I need you to save me. I can't do this anymore. That's when true conversion is ready to happen. When you have confidence in your own righteousness, you're keeping salvation at arm's length. Religion is the practice of dead works. Repentance from dead works is a foundational teaching. So in Hebrews 6, it says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. A dead work is just something that you're trying to pull off. You're trying to earn acceptance with God. You're trying to show God, look at, look at, I've got it together. I can do this. I can do this. Oh, I've I've told a story. I've told this story a lot through the years, but several years ago, I I, I was working as a draftsman in Detroit area, and I went, to, you know, every Friday I go to the bank in the old days. <clears throat> I'm in this line. There's probably 50, 60 people in line, you know, snaking through the turnstile. And there was a man up ahead, and and he saw somebody he knew, hey, how you doing? I used to hate that, being in the crowd like that, and somebody wants to have a conversation with you on the other side of the room. Apparently, they'd gone to church together at one time, and this person yells to this guy, hey, I haven't seen you in church. Yeah, yeah, I got to clean up my life. I get my life cleaned up, then I'll come back to church. Right then. You know, and I, I can see he's at the other end, but we're, our lines are moving toward each other. We're going to pass each other. And I know God's telling me I got to say something to him. And uh, so as I was passing him, I said, hey, I heard you saying you got to clean your life up before you go back to church. I said, you know, that's impossible, don't you? Because if you go to church and they're preaching Jesus, he's the only one that can clean you up. You need to consider going back whether you're cleaned up or not, and he'll take care of you. And he just stared at me. And sometimes you can tell God was really, was really on him, you know. And uh, 
I probably had little beads of sweat on my forehead. Like I don't like doing a lot of that stuff in public, but I knew God wanted me to say that to him. But that's the common thinking. I got to clean myself up. That's a religious thought. I got to show God that I got it together. Then I can go back among his people. <clears throat> that's, that's looking for dead works. What can I pull off? Dead works are, for the, for the Jew, the dead works were following the law, thinking you got salvation. The law was never a, going to produce salvation. The law was to maintain blessing. It was obeying that produced blessing and provision. It wasn't for salvation. Salvation was always Abraham believed God and was accounted him for righteousness. That's, that's what counted. Um, <clears throat> religion is a work of the flesh. The flesh is a reference to our physical bodies or our fallen human nature. You know, I, in most of the translations that I have, it uses the word flesh. But if you've got a newer translation, it's going to say human nature or, or natural man instead of flesh. Our flesh wants to operate independently of God's influence and rule. The works of the flesh are exhausting. When we're walking in the spirit, which is living in agreement with the spirit of life, he fills us with purpose and energy. Consistently being filled with the spirit produces the fruit of the spirit, which includes joy. And according to Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's where it comes from. It's produced from within. It's transformation. It's transferred to me. I'm righteous because the, tra the transference of the righteousness of Christ came to me when by faith I had a born-again experience. I'm put in him and he's put in me. And all the benefits come to me by faith. It isn't because I worked it out. And if I've had that transition, then he changes what's going on inside of me. That's what we want. That's what we want to lead people into. That's how we want to disciple people. We want to show them we come to the Word, and we're asking the Holy Spirit to transfer the truth that I'm going to learn in here into my soul and make a difference in me. You know, I used to tell people all the time, the Christian life isn't difficult. It's impossible. Nobody can do this. You can't do this. You, you definitely can't do it consistently. If not for the power of God, I don't stand a chance with this. And so over time, to produce maturity it's just waiting on him and trusting him to pull this off. <clears throat> now, we begin in the Spirit and we grow in the Spirit. And that's what Paul was trying to tell the Galatians. Religion doesn't emphasize relationship. Listen to Galatians 4, 6 and that we're going to eventually get to. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. A religious person doesn't refer to God as their father and definitely doesn't use the word Abba. God's after relationship. You know, when God created the first two people, it was a husband and wife, a family. It wasn't a president and vice president, chairman and vice chairman, CEO and CFO. It's relationship. That's what he's after, family relationship. But religious people want to look at a dominating God. They don't understand the, a loving Heavenly Father. I fear the Lord, but He's a loving God. It's like having a good father. A good father looks at you and says, Son, I told you to clean your room or there's going to be consequences. He doesn't just pull out a stick and beat you, but He means what He says. That's a good father. And relationship pulls us into this good relationship with the Father. Walking in agreement with the Holy Spirit will defeat the desires of our flesh. Galatians 5, 16 to 18, I say then walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh, the, the flesh lusts against the Spirit. So there's a fighting that's going on. The only way I can win this is to submit to the work of the Spirit. It's the only way that's going to do this. And if you're leading people, you're discipling people, that's what you want. You want to speak words that are empowered by the Spirit of God to provoke the Spirit that's within them to move forward. You don't want to frustrate. You want to feed, provoke thought, and get them to make decisions based on the Word of God and the Spirit that's working within them. We're told to be continually filled with the Spirit. Most of you know Ephesians 5.18 be filled with the Spirit. When the, a literal translation would, would be, be being filled with the Spirit, continually renewing and having something renewed within you. It isn't every day asking for more of that Spirit power. 
So let me give you just a couple final thoughts here. <clears throat> you have to be in the Word. So Paul is trying to tell them, you started in the Spirit, and now you move to the flesh. Well, how are you going to side, uh, sidestep that? You've got to be in the Word. You've got to be growing. And look, just check yourself. How much time are you spending in the Word? And I don't mean, you, you need some paper, not just electronic. If, you, if you're out and you, I use, I use things on my phone uh, as a study help. But that isn't where my main feeding is. My main feeding is going to be with paper. So I can write notes in here. I can put things in here that I've discovered. I hold it. I can, I can hold one page and I can look to something else. There's something about having the book right in front of you and just this constant feeding place where we meet him. Walking in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit is learned through trial and error. Paul wants them to maintain this connection with the Spirit of God. But, man, that's hard work. And when you're first starting, you need to be around somebody that understands this stuff. It's hard. It's trial and error. You think God's leading you to do something, you do it, and, man, it doesn't work out real well. Well, now i got to go back and talk to somebody. Did I hear God or did I not? It's possible that I did something, it didn't work out well, and it was God. But somebody needs to help me sort through this because walking in the Spirit is a hard thing. We have to do it in relationship with others. Always be willing to learn something new from the Holy Spirit. A religious spirit can be rigid and reject what's deemed new. I'm in a period right now where I'm learning some things that I never thought that I would agree to. And there's just topics, things that it appears that God has really opened up the eyes of some, if we'll listen, he'll show us things that we didn't see. So don't be, don't run from new, check some things out, but don't be naive. Do it in a group, do it with somebody else and, and try to make those discoveries. And lastly, you must continually ask for more of the Holy Spirit power and function in your life. And I love, uh, I'm going to read Luke 11, 9 to 13. This is where we'll end. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. This is Jesus speaking. And he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And a proper translation would be, how much more will your Father give Holy Spirit? He's not talking about the person of the Spirit, because at salvation, the transition, we have him. He's, he's in us. This is talking about the function, the filling, the leading of the Holy Spirit. I want him functioning in my life. I want to learn to hear his voice. I want to follow him. I want to develop a sensitivity when he says, stop, I stop. When he says, go, I go. When he says, don't buy that, I don't buy that. When he says, stop looking at that, I stop looking at that. These are the things that you want to develop that. And over time, it takes time to do that. But it's possible, and it's only possible as we continually are asking for more and more. If you got to ask, seek, and knock for more of the function of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying, don't stop asking for that. Don't stop. Because if you began in the Spirit, in order to continue in the Spirit, you got to ask for more and more and more. Drive into that. If you're a discipler, you need the power of the Holy Spirit so that you've got something to offer those that you're leading, that you're mentoring, that you're spiritually parenting. We can't do this on our own. And we are in a, we're in a period in this country right now where chaos is coming in like a flood. It's a tsunami. Division. Um, I had an experience at the store the other day, and it's like there is so much tension that's out there. We need to be walking in the Spirit and f filled up with the fruit of the Spirit to be able to maintain an even keel and represent the, the kingdom of God properly and to live it properly because of all the pressures that are after us. We can do this, but we got to set our face like a flint and make up our mind. I'm not backing off. I'm going to constantly I'm gonna be like a pit bull on God's pant leg and ask him for more of the Spirit every day and seek to obey him. So, Father, give us the strength to do that. Give us the wisdom and discernment. We, we don't want to begin strong and end weak. We want to end stronger. 
Fill us with your spirit. Anoint us with power and strength. Give us wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of you. Fill us with what we need for the day, Lord, so that we can represent you and we can see the kingdom of God expand among us. Thank you for being a faithful God and one who answers that prayer. You said keep asking, seeking, and knocking. That means it's not easy sometimes to get this anointing. We're going to keep coming after you, Lord, because this is what we need. We thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen.